Hello, everybody. Y'all doing good? My name's Rob. Hello, hello. Good to see you. Um, yeah, so I'm one of the guys that'll preach to you this weekend. Really, just uh, tonight, I, I get to speak to y'all. And so I want to say welcome. I, I, I was backstage when Zach asked, uh, how many of y'all, this is your first time here? So if you don't mind, raise your hands again. Oh, man, that's awesome. Welcome. Welcome. Good to see y'all. This is our last fall retreat of 2019. So, man, stoked that you guys are here. Yeah, it's exciting. Um, so for our fall retreats this year at Snowbird, we've been doing a, a series on the Romans Road. All right, And what that means is we've been going through the book of Romans and all of our sermons have come out of Romans. And because what the Romans Road is, that we just take these really, really crystal clear passages in the book of Romans that brings to light the truth of the gospel. That you could really take these passages that we're going to preach through and, and somebody you know that doesn't know Christ... You could just walk through these passages and explain what they mean and then as a way to share the gospel. And so that's what we want to do this weekend is I mean, to get a good look, a clear look at the goodness and the beauty and the power of the gospel. All right? So I mean, we're going to play hard. Uh, I think, man, the Lord's going to bless us with just beautiful uh, weather all weekend, be nice and cool, crisp. But uh, we're coming off of like four days straight of raining, which we desperately needed, but I think, man, we're going to get a break from that, so we'll play hard uh, anytime we're outside. Even when we come in here, man, like tomorrow morning and evening, we'll play some games in here, but man, when we get to this part and we go before the Lord to worship Him through song and then through the, the hearing of His Word, then we're going to take this serious, and so we're going to dive in. Go ahead and turn in your Bibles to Romans chapter 3. All right, that's going to be fun. It's going to be good. Romans chapter 3. And because uh, the, first, the first verse we're going to look at, it says this. Romans 3, verse 23. The word of God says, For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. So it's a big deal. Because later on in the book of Romans, it tells us, For the wages of sin is death. Man, and if you know anything, then you know that about the Bible, that you know that, man, that death that it's talking about is not just and not only that one day we'll physically die, but it's talking about this second death that's going to come, that it's appointed unto man once to die and then to face judgment. Man, and if we appear before God in our sin and he judges us based on our sin, which he says he's going to do in Romans chapter 2, that he's going to render to each one of us according to our deeds, our thoughts, our words, our actions. If we stand before a holy and good and just God and he judges us, and the Bible says it paints this picture of condemnation, of, of eternal death, of eternal wrath. So when it says here, for all have sinned, and fall short of the glory of God, I man, we got to hit pause. we got to hit time out and think about, okay, what is being said here? What, what is Almighty God, right? The, the creator of the universe, the one who spoke and the universe came into existence, what is he saying to us right here, right now in this passage? This is fall short of his glory. So a good question to ask would be, all right, so what's his glory? What, what do we mean when we talk about the glory of God? It's a big deal. Like, if you go to church, I mean, you hear about it a lot. We talk a lot about the glory of God. We sing about the glory of God. There's so much in the Bible where God is talking about how he's jealous for his glory, that he's putting his glory on display. But, man, what, what does that even mean? And I heard one pastor talk about it that, that made sense to me, and I just I've held on to it, where he talked about, man, the glory of God what the glory of God is, is all of his goodness, all of his holiness, right? That there, when we say God is holy, we're saying there's, there is no one else like God, the one true living God. He is the holy other. Everything else is creation. He alone is creator, and he's pure. He's perfect. 
and all of his ways, that he's perfect in his power, in his wisdom, in his goodness, in his steadfast, unchanging love. He's awesome. He's majestic. He's infinite in his goodness. And he's worthy, that he's worthy of praise and honor, that he has infinite value. And his glory is when all of that is seen and perceived by us, by his creation. When we see God for who God really is, and then we respond with worship. We respond by loving him. We respond by desiring to submit to him. That's what we were made for. We were made by Jesus and for Jesus. We were made for the glory of God. To take in like as if all that awesomeness about God, who he is, like that it radiates and we perceive it, we see it, we experience it, and we respond with just pure worship, love, adoration, all these words that just mean he's awesome. He's truly awesome. But here it says we fall short, that we fell short of that. We were created to see it and to respond to it, to submit to it, but we fell short. So... uh, Man, the guy who's going to preach tomorrow morning and tomorrow night, he's our camp director. His name's uh, Brody. And uh, this past year, his oldest son, his name's Tucker, he, uh, he went out for track and field, and he ended up doing um, the, uh, the long jump. Y'all know what that is? It's where you... <laughs> that was a stupid question. I apologize. <laughs> you run and jump. Yeah. So he was doing that. And it was the first time he'd ever done it. I mean, he just was a natural. He's, he's, a, he's a gifted athlete, but he was just a natural at the long jump, man. And he ended up going to state and winning state. Really impressive. And he jumped, uh, let me see, I wrote down to make sure I get it right, 22 feet, 4 inches. You know what that is? Like far away from where he started, right? <laughs> That's impressive. I, I really don't know how far I could jump because a lot, when I was thinking about this and last time I tried it, like, I hurt my hamstring and then I couldn't even walk. That's yeah, sad. Don't, yeah. I came so close to saying really old man preacher stuff, but I caught myself. Yes. But Tucker can jump really far. 22 feet, four inches. And he won state. And so that got me thinking, like, all right, well, what's the furthest anybody has ever jumped? And it was this dude, uh, Mike Powell. He jumped 29 feet, 4 inches, almost 30 feet through the air. You know what, you know what I call that? Flying. <laughs> Flying. Like, that, like my brain, I don't comprehend that. I mean, that's just crazy. That is so far. It's, it's so impressive what a gifted athlete who dedicates himself to one thing. I'm going to run and jump. It's kind of funny. For my country, there you go. For his country, he ran and he jumped almost 30 feet. But then I thought, what if that joker, do you guys think this way? Do you ever think like, like, what if I had to jump for my life? You ever like walk in between two buildings? Like what if somebody was shooting at me and I was running on the top of this building? Why? I don't know. I'm just up there running. Some guy's shooting at me. And I have to jump between this building and that building. Could I make it? Do you ever think that? I think about that mess all the time. <laughs> and, like, I think, what if, what if that guy, what if Mike Powell had to jump, like, 35 feet for his life? For his life. You know what he would do? He would die. <laughs> he would die because that dude spent, like, that was it. That was his best jump ever. And that was like the best jump ever for humans. He would die. And you know what? If I had to run, and if I was like right behind him, and I saw him run and jump, and like his fingers scraped whatever, like the other side, the cliff, and I'm like, I'm going to get it, and I jump, and I would go like five feet. (laughs) I'd laugh on my way down, like that wasn't even close. (laughs) But you know where me and Mike are both landing? 
dead on the bottom, right? Like, on the way down, be like, you did great. <laughs> Better than the rest of us. <laughs> Thank you for the sound effect. Yeah, we're, we both die. We don't make it. Why? Because we both fell short, right? And I think, man, think about this passage. When it's just saying that every human being is as bad as they could be. Like, because we do that. We compare ourselves to other people. You can pick, pick your person, and you can come out looking pretty good. Because, yeah, maybe I'm not as sinful as that guy. The things I think about, the things I say, the things I do. But what he's saying is, man, we don't compare ourselves to other people. You were created to glorify God, to see him for who he is, and to respond with perfect worship, a life absolutely submitted and committed to living for the glory of God so that you, by your life, as a creature made in the image and likeness of God, that you would live out his goodness. And man, he says, we've all sinned. We missed it. We fell short. And the wages of our sin is death. And so... Like, why? Right? Why? If God created us for his glory, if he created us to know him and to love him, to serve him, then how do we get here? <laughs> why, why, is this, why is this the case? For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Turn over to Romans chapter 1. Romans chapter 1. I'm going to start in verse 16. First couple of verses here are pretty familiar, but we're going to roll through them pretty quick. Word of God says this, For I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. For in it, in the gospel, in the story of the life, the death, and the resurrection of Jesus, in the gospel, for in it the righteousness of God is revealed, from faith for faith, as it is written, the righteous shall live by faith. For the wrath, because it's that such good news because of this. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who by their unrighteousness suppress the truth. What truth? What truth did we, we suppress? The glory of God who he is, why we're here, what this life is all about, how we're supposed to live, who we're supposed to be. We suppressed that truth from the beginning. Because of that, his wrath, and, and God's wrath, man, it's not like this out of control anger, like he just flies off the handle and starts smashing stuff. Man, his wrath, man, the Bible says God is slow to anger. He's slow to anger. And he abounds in grace and mercy and steadfast love. But his wrath is sure. His judgment is just. And he made us for himself. And we rebelled against him. Because it says this. Verse 19. For what can be known about God is plain to them. Because God has shown it to them. For his invisible attributes, namely his eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world and the things that have been made. So, man, the complexity and the beauty, and the wonder of creation itself should draw our attention to there must be an all-powerful, awesome God. That, man, if we could see correctly, right, not with our physical eyes, but, man, if we could perceive, if we could understand, if we could comprehend that, man, when we take in creation, we should be able to see the fingerprints of God on it. Say, man, only he could do this. Only he could do this. For although they knew God, they did not honor him as God or give thanks to him, but they became futile or empty or perverted in their thinking, and their foolish hearts were darkened. Keep saying there 
or they. You know who they're talking about? And our first parents. Our first, our first parents. When they sinned, when they rebelled against God, when they suppressed the truth, when they were unthankful. You know what the Bible says in Romans chapter 5? Man, that when Adam, our first father, when he sinned, we all sinned. We were there with him. He represented us. This is all of us. Became futile in their thinking, and their foolish hearts were darkened. Claiming to be wise, they became fools and exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images resembling mortal man and birds and animals and creeping things. Birds. We exchanged the glory of God for birds. So I came home one day, and uh, man, it was, it was my oldest daughter. She's 12 now, and uh, it was when she was like four or five, and I remember I came home, and I think we had just got Netflix, and uh, it was a new thing. It was awesome, and I remember I came home, and she was so excited to see me and like ran up and you know, jumped in my arms, scooped her up, hugged her, and she was so excited to show me this uh, show she'd been watching on Netflix. So I'm like, man, I'm all in. This is my, my, my daughter, man, my baby. I'm like, yeah, I'll hang out with you. And uh, she wanted to watch. I thought it was going to be like Dora or whatever, you know, mindless thing that was going on. But she wanted to watch this documentary put on by uh, uh, National Geographic. Thank you. Um, that she wanted to sit down and watch with me. I was like, seriously? And it was like this whole, I mean, it was like an hour long. And she was stoked. She just got done watching it. She wanted to watch it again. And I sit down, I'm like, all right. And it's on this bird. It's on this bird. It's, have you ever heard of the harpy eagle? Have you ever heard of that? Fascinating. It's a, it's a giant bird that lives in South America. So I'm like, I don't, I'm not very interested, but I'll, I mean, my daughter's geeking out, so I like her. I'm going to hang out. And so we start watching it, and I, I got pretty sucked in. And, you know, like the, the narrator speaking in a British accent, so already you're like, well, he's smarter than me. I should pay attention to what he's saying. And... Uh, and the whole premise of the documentary, why these guys had left their homes, comfortable, climate-controlled homes with refrigerators and indoor plumbing and all the glorious things that that brings into your life. Like, they left that to camp out in the Amazon jungle because... No one had ever taken a picture of a baby harpy eagle before. And I don't know about you, but I refuse to live in a world where that's true. And so these brave souls sacrificed like a year of their life to take a picture of a baby harpy eagle. Spoiler alert, the baby harpy eagle... It looks like every other ugly baby bird you'd ever seen in your life. Like, right. Yep, there it is. So these guys are out there, man. They're camped out. And the bird's impressive because they're showing, you know, they're talking about it. It's like a six, it, it, the, the wingspan is like six feet long. The bird's like three and a half feet tall. And it's got, you know, you know how birds, they don't have uh, claws, but uh, talons, right? And like their back talon, man, it's like four inches long. It's like a dagger. And the thing that sucked me in was it showed them hunting howler monkeys. Yeah, that's a big monkey. It's a big monkey with the big fangs. And what it would do is it would like, you know, fly through the sky with its eagle eyes. It would see the howler monkey and it would, it would swoop down behind them real. I mean, just where it's not flapping, it's just like gliding. But I mean, it's coming down from super high up, so I mean, it's just like a rocket coming down silently through the sky, and it comes up behind that monkey. The monkey's just hanging out, like being a monkey, right, like eating bugs off its buddy's back, and I'm like, all right, what's going to happen here? It's a documentary. My four-year-old loves it. Surely they'll pan away. Oh, no. All of a sudden, the bird comes in, and bam! It takes that talon, that four-inch dagger, and stabs in its, its method of killing is it goes up underneath the skull, into the brain. And you know what the monkey does? Nothing ever again. Like, <laughs> it goes, it's eating bugs, and all of a sudden, 
It's gone. It's just, yeah, and he carries it off. And I like, I see this, and I look over at my four-year-old, and she's going, <laughs> I'm like, oh, gosh. I'm like, all right, all right, either, either I'm a really good dad or we're going to need help. But I'm sucked in, man. I'm like, what else are they going to show? And then, and then, oh, this is the other thing that it hunts is the, uh, the sloth. <laughs> right? Right? Yeah, it's, it's hilarious. I, don't, I, I shouldn't even say hunt, right? Because it was more like the bird's not even hiding, right? Because they see him come in and they're like, No, bam, right, it's just over, it's beautiful. So we're watching, man, and so, uh, but here's the whole thing is they, they nest super high up in these incredibly tall trees, right? And, and so they've got this whole camera system rigged up in the right spot in the canopy, man, and they've got it faced right at those little harpy eagle eggs, but they got an issue. You know, one of the lenses is all fogged up, and they're like, this is why we're here. So they gotta they gotta ascend up they gotta send this guy up these ropes to clean off the lens. Well, the problem is, Mama Harpy Eagle is not cool with that, right? It's too close to the nest, and so they like draw straws. And this one dude, like uh, Timmy, man, he draws a short short straw, and so he's got to go up there to to wipe off the lens. And they like they outfit this guy in body armor, full on body armor with a helmet with like like an old Roman. Century helmet with a little flap to protect from the brain stabbing talon. And uh, well, that guy starts climbing up and he's ascending this rope. And he's, uh, and it's, I mean, he's just pouring sweat and they're talking to him. He's got a mic inside his helmet and they're, they're like, All right, you're good, you're good. She's not, you know, the mom's out hunting or whatever. And they're like, And then he gets almost there. He's like, I don't know, he's got another 10 feet to go. And uh, they go, Stop, 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 stop. And Timmy stops. And that mommy harpy eagle, like, she, she's, she's up in another tree. You know how birds turn their neck, like, way too far? It's just freaky. It's like acting like it's looking over here, but really, it's like, you know, neck spun all the way around it, staring right at Timmy. And like, don't move, don't move. And it falls out of that tree, man, just glides right over him. And you can hear everything go, right? And, but, it, but it disappears. And so, like, all right, go. You're almost there. And so he goes, and he, like, reaches back to grab his little cloth, and out of nowhere, I mean, just bam, right to the back of his head. And Timmy's like about to wipe the lens, and he just goes, thunk. And I think, he's dead. <laughs> I saw what happened to the monkey. Our brains are in the same place. And again, I look over at my daughter, and she goes, <laughs> I'm like, I've broken her. She's broken. She's no good anymore, you know? And, uh, and they're like talking, to like, Timmy, Timmy. And finally he goes, <laughs> and, and they're like, are you okay? Are you okay? We'll come get you. We'll come get you. And he just goes, <laughs> and then comes on down. And I mean, incredible. And yes, now we have pictures. You can look them up. Baby harpy eagles. You know what me and my daughter did? I turned off Netflix and I said, Molly, we will now worship the harpy eagle. No, don't laugh at that. That's heresy. <laughs> no, why? Because that's crazy. So, but time out. Did you hear what, what we just read a minute ago? That what we did, what we all did, was we exchanged the glory of God, of worshiping Almighty God, the one true living God who has the power to speak universes into existence, who's perfect in his power, his presence, his wisdom, his goodness. He overflows with grace and mercy and love who made us to experience him forever. That we exchange that for worshiping creation, for animals and birds and creeping things. You know, and the reality is there are people who worship birds. They, they have little carved images. But the truth is, like in our culture, we don't see that. In our culture, man, that, that just seems crazy. People worship statues, like I don't, we don't get that. But the reality is, man, what we really did was we exchanged worshiping God ultimately for worshiping ourselves. Because every false religion, 
every false god that a human has ever come up with, that that god solely exists for, for me, to serve me. It's a complete reversal. Complete reversal. We were made to worship God, and instead, we make gods to worship us. And we do the same thing. We're just as guilty. For all have sinned. When we give our affection and our worship to anything or anyone other than God. So when he says, verse 24, Therefore God gave them up in the lust of their hearts to impurity, to the dishonoring of their bodies among themselves, because they exchanged the truth about God for a lie and worshipped and served the creature rather than the creator who is blessed forever. Amen. For all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. The wages of sin is death. But, that's not the whole verse. For the wages of sin is death. But, the gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus. And this is what's so good about the gospel. This is what's so glorious about the gospel. It's because in our sin, when we suppress the truth, we exchange worshiping God for worshiping anything else. And the Bible says, yeah, our, our minds are dark, our hearts are darkened, our, our minds became futile. Like, we can't think right about God. We don't think right about the world. We don't think right about ourselves. We don't see our sin for what it is in light of the holiness of God. But God in his grace, God in his mercy, God in his steadfast, loyal, infinite, sacrificial love through Christ, makes a way for us not only to be forgiven of our sin, not only to have God's wrath removed from us, but he makes it possible to restore us to the people he created us to be. Do you know that? Man, he made you. He formed you in your mother's womb. He made you to know him. Personally, to see his glory. And not just for a few years, not just here and now, but man, for all of eternity. To know the deepest joy and peace and satisfaction as you look into the face of Jesus. And experience the glory of God. That's why he made you. And through Christ, and we can be restored to that. Listen to this. Turn, turn back to chapter 3 again. Go back to our first verse, verse 23. <clears throat> For all have sinned, and fall short of the glory of God, and are justified. That word means declared righteous. We all fall short of the glory of God, and are justified by His grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God put forward as a propitiation by His blood, to be received by faith. What does that mean? It means you can absolutely be forgiven. You can be restored into a right relationship with God. God's wrath that's revealed from heaven against you that you would spend all of eternity experiencing, that can be removed. And in place of your sin, in place of your death, in place of your hell, you can have the righteousness, the perfect obedience of Jesus that Jesus in his life, everything he thought, everything he said, everything he did was perfect because he's God in the flesh. That our God humbled himself and became one of us so he could live the life 
that we were created to live and have it. He did it, man. He was tempted in every way as we are, yet without sin. He was always obedient. He always did the will of the Father. Why? Because, man, we don't just have a sin problem. We have a, a fall short of God's glory problem. Jesus didn't. He didn't. That chasm, that gulf that we couldn't jump, Jesus did it. And as a gift, he gives it to us forever. So God could look at us not through our sin, but through the perfect spotless righteousness, the goodness, the purity of Jesus. And he went to the cross. It says as a propitiation. What does that mean? It means he bore. He absorbed all of God's wrath towards us. All of it. What would have taken me all of eternity, as in I never would have finished, being consumed by the wrath of God, that on the cross, Jesus satisfied the wrath of God in our place by his death, by his sacrifice. So we could be free. So we could be forgiven. So we could spend eternity with him, living for his glory. And the gospel's good. So and tonight, I don't know, I, I don't know. I think probably for most of us, as you hear this story, you're going, yes, yes, that's what I believe. And that, that you hear of the glory of God and you go, you know what, man, I, I, <laughs> leading into this weekend, man, I've been distracted. I've let the things of the world compete for my allegiance that I owe, owe only to Jesus. And then, yeah, but that's it. That's what I want to live for. I want to live my life for God's glory because Jesus has rescued me. I think of a lot of us in the room, and that's where you're at. But probably not all of us. Probably some of us have come in here, and the truth is you're still in your sin. You don't know Jesus like this. You don't know God's forgiveness. And what we say to you, man, is this forgiveness is available. The forgiveness that God offers is available to you. And the Bible says if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, that Jesus is God, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, he'll save you. If you, if you repent of your sins, if you recognize, man, I, I've been living for my own glory, and God would open your eyes to see that that's empty, that's empty, but his glory, that'll sustain you. That'll give you hope. That'll give you peace. That'll give you joy. And our prayer is that this weekend you would surrender to the gospel. And so in a minute, man, I'm, I'm going to pray, and I'm going to give you instructions. And if you're not a believer, I just want to say to you, if, if you're sitting here and you go, man, I, I don't know Jesus, then you need to grab your student pastor and grab one of the leaders that brought you in a little while, our, our staff are going to introduce themselves to you in a small group setting. And you pull one of them aside and, and just ask, okay, what, what does it look like to follow Jesus? What does it look like to be saved? What, is, what does that mean to be saved? We'd love to have that conversation with you. Love to show you from Scripture what it looks like to surrender to the gospel. For the rest of us, I think, man, let's take advantage of this weekend. You were made to live for the glory of God. So now, man, we got this weekend to play hard, to have good fellowship with one another, but away from the distractions of our normal day-to-day -day life, let's focus on the goodness of the gospel. Let's set our aim on living for his glory. Let me pray. Lord Jesus, love you. God, thank you for your word. Thank you for the gospel. Thank you for Jesus. And I pray tonight that you would set students free from the lie that we can live for anything other than your glory. I pray that you set them free, forgive them, redeem them, grant them the gift of repentance and faith. They trust in you. And I pray for your church, Lord, that it would be built up, that we'd be built up in you, that we'd be hungry for your word and hungry for your glory. We wouldn't be satisfied with anything other than living our lives to honor you. Love you and need you. In Christ's name, amen.